yeah, well, uh, thanks for, for um, well, I suppose for, for going on an introduction, um, but uh, no, thanks so much for having me, Derek, uh, and Learn the Birds in general. It's, it's really um, wonderful to be asked to speak. And uh, as, as I'm sure any researcher will tell you, it's always such a pleasure to, to get to talk about your work and, um, and uh, yeah, get to share it with people. So, so thanks so much for having me on. Very excited to be here. Um, and yeah, what I'll what I'll do with this talk is uh, is basically give you a a sort of introduction to uh, my research group uh, in a in a sort of broad sense, um, and then I'll, I'll focus on on climate warming, and then a sort of overview of my of my PhD on on southern yellowbilled hornbills. Um, so yeah, I, I hope hope everyone enjoys it. Um, and by by way of introduction, uh, basically I I spent my entire uh, postgraduate uh, career with the hot birds research project and it's a it's an international uh, research group that's focused primarily on understanding the biology of birds that deal with uh, very high temperatures or, or heat stress um, and the threats that those birds are facing so naturally you know the, the focus of, of uh, studying birds that are dealing with heat stress means we do a lot of our work in very hot and arid areas um, and over my sort of nine years now with the Hot Birds Research Project, my uh, my research has seen me do physically work in the in the Karoo uh, down near Port Elizabeth. I've been in the Kalahari Desert uh, for both my honors and for my PhD. Uh, I've done work in uh, North America in the Sonoran Desert there. I've been on well, I've actually been on the west coast of South Africa as well, doing some work. And I and I've worked with a lot of uh, data. Not I haven't unfortunately. Uh, been there doing collecting data, but I've done a lot of work with birds from Australia in the in the Gascoigne region as well. So, um, so I've through my period with with the Birds Research Project, I've kind of moved around a lot, either physically or with with data. Um, so it's been a really exciting time. And uh, essentially, as I'm sure any of you know, but it's always worth reiterating, um, deserts are basically they're very hot and they're very dry. And they generally have a really low primary productivity. Um, so they're sort of these really extreme places for organisms to live. And with the climate uh, now rapidly changing as it is, we need to know how uh, the birds, or, or more broadly all the organisms, but obviously my focus on the birds, um, in those areas are de dealing with their current environmental challenges um, to know how they might react to changes and the, the new status quo in the future. So uh, this talk is, is sort of an overview of my uh, PhD, which I started in, in 2018. Um, and that's you know, it's quite some time ago now. I know it doesn't feel that long ago because COVID kind of was a blip that no one really wants to acknowledge, but um, it, it was quite some, quite some time ago now. Um, but I started it just after finishing my master's with, with Dr. Ben Smith uh, at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. And I, I, I uh, moved down to Cape Town to uh, start my PhD there. So uh, anyway, before I get into the uh, hornbills more specifically, um, I'm just going to I'm going to open with this graph. I promise there are not too many graphs in this talk, um, but I want to open with this one because it really sets the scene of why the Hotbirds Research Project does the work that it does. So this graph has the uh, average daily maximum temperature between air temperature between October and March each year. Uh, that's on the y axis. And uh, this is for three different weather stations out in the Kalahari Desert. Um, and uh, this is for data from about, well, from 1960 up until uh, around about 2020 or 2021. And um, basically you can see that uh, at some point, basically temperatures start really increasing. It, it starts getting a lot hotter out in the Kalahari. Um, and what that means is that the organisms that live there and the organisms which attempt to breed between October and March uh, each year, which is uh, for, for those of you who are internationals, um, it's, it's over the austral spring and through the summer, uh, they're facing these uh, increasingly challenging breeding conditions. And this pattern is true for a lot of uh, seasonally hot arid regions around the world. So how it's affecting the organisms there, and obviously with my interest on birds, how it's affecting them is, is you know, something now of, of quite a major concern and something that we really need to focus on. So uh, now I've come to my uh, study species, which is of course the, the Southern Yellowboard Hornbill. Um, I hope 
those of you that are joining from from international locations i hope you uh this isn't your first time seeing them they're these absolutely majestic birds um but basically i'm going to be talking about the uh torrid horrible relationship that they share with the climate uh climate warming that's going on in the kalahari and uh yes while i while i hope that many of you are familiar with them i'm derek living in hutzbrate i'm sure uh, is is uh, pretty fed up with them as they can be quite uh, familiar. Um, but uh, I studied them basically because they're they're really pertinent to study the study of the biological effects of climate change, and and that's for quite a few reasons. Um, so the first thing is that a large part of their range, um, which includes the the place that I studied them, which I'll talk about in a moment, is in the Kalahari. So what that means is that um, Populations, uh, populations of southern yellow hornbills across a huge part of their range are currently experiencing that really rapid climate warming. Um, and then second, they, uh, they forage primarily on the ground and they breed sort of, at least at my field site, exclusively over the spring and through the summer. So that combines to make them really vulnerable to high temperatures and to the low resource availability that you would typically associate with high temperatures and drought, especially in a desert. Uh, and then thirdly, they are similar to most hornbill species. They uh, quite readily breed inside nest boxes. So that makes it possible for us to look into a lot of really uh, neat questions regarding their reproductive ecology, because we have access uh, to the duration of the breeding attempt inside of that box and access to the females' eggs and nestlings inside. So my field site was a place called uh, Kuruman River Reserve. It's, it's out in the, in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, quite close to the Botswana border. Um, it's sort of uh, considered an arid savanna woodland, and it has, uh, it's sort of dominated by camel thorn trees, which are uh, typically where the hornbills would find natural cavities in the trees to, uh, in which to breed. But in 2008, a research team went out to this to this field site and set up this nest box system. And since then, uh, we've had about 30 to 50 nest boxes up at the field site for the hornbills to use instead of the natural cavities so that we can study them. Um, and I basically studied various aspects of their reproductive ecology uh, as they went about breeding or not breeding in those uh, nest boxes. So this video is I think going to be a little bit jumpy, but uh, I, I basically wanted to just show you this just out of interest. Um, my field site is the same place that they film um, Meerkat Manor. It's the, it's the location of the Kalahari Meerkat project, which has been running for decades and decades. Um, and uh, it's really just sort of a, a, an absolutely remarkable part of my PhD was being in the same place. Uh, this, these are my awful videography skills, so I do apologize for that. But um, just being in the same place as, as uh, National Geographic teams and BBC teams filming these meerkats um, was, was really quite a special experience getting to meet them and interact with them and, and uh, was really just something quite, quite interesting. And what I, uh, what I also want to point out is that, you know, a lot of researchers do their work kind of in isolation. And I was uh, sort of uh, lucky, I suppose, in, in, a, in a lot of ways that I was not alone at my field site. I, uh, I not only had these very habituated meerkats that, you know, would war dance another group of meerkats right past my feet, uh, but I also had between sort of 10 to 30 other people on the reserve studying uh, other bird species and uh, primarily studying the meerkats or collecting data on the meerkats, but also on squirrels, uh, ground squirrels and uh, mole rats. Um, so really a, a sort of interdis interdisciplinary team of researchers at this field site, which is which is really quite quite amazing um, that not a lot of people get to experience a very cool part of it. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll get on to the aims of my PhD. Um, and uh, what you'll have to bear in mind here is that uh, this is this is the abridged uh, three point aims of, of a 250 odd long page document. Um, so I've tried to summarize it uh, as best I can. Uh, basically, firstly, I look into what role resources, which for the hornbills is food and water, the, the hornbills, southern hornbills, hornbills don't drink uh, open water, they get all of their water from their diet. So it's what role resources, which is, again, food and food and water, play in affecting the relationships that birds show between their reproductive ecology and temperature. 
So basically at this point, a lot of really excellent work has been done over the last three decades or so with some even predating that, um, that has established the effects of high temperatures on the physiology and behavior and reproduction of birds. But not a lot of them have, have looked at factoring in how food and water fit into the picture. So that's sort of the first aim is to look broadly at that. Then second, uh, based on the breeding data that's been collected on this population of hornbills since 2008, um, when, the, when the breeding first, uh, when the breeding monitoring first started, um, I'm gonna, I wanted to look at what, what are the long-term trends basically in their, in their breeding over that um, you know, more than a decade now of, of, of breeding. And then lastly, uh, how does all of that fit into the picture of how vulnerable Arizona birds and obviously specifically the hornbill um, are to the rapid climate change that they're experiencing. So in, in the background of these slides, uh, you'll see some of the different views of my field site, absolutely gorgeous place. And, and I can really encourage any of you that haven't been out to the Kalahari to, to please do give it a, a visit. Um, it is absolutely stunning. And uh, I, I recommend going in the spring or the autumn when the, when the temperatures are more tolerable. I would not recommend trudging around um, for months and months in the uh, in the peak summer heat, but it is it is a wonderful place. So I really just want to recommend to any of you that you please do get out there. All right. So uh, the first thing that uh, that I'm going to sort of need to set the scene a little bit here. Basically, um, I need to explain how my study system uh, worked, how the hornbills breed, and how I collected my data, so that you can uh, understand basically any kind of results and conclusions that I draw. So in this picture. It's, you can actually see just about everything that you need to. Um, so the first thing, obviously, uh, is the hornbills. Um, the, you know, those are obviously quite central to the study of hornbills. Um, and uh, here it's a, it's a male and a female. The female is the one at the nest that's busy provisioning to a chick. Um, and that brings me to the second thing, which is the nest box that the female is, is on. Um, hornbills breed, as I said, in natural cavities in the wild, but uh, at my study site, they use these nest boxes instead that we've put up for them. And these nest boxes have, uh, you can't really see it in this picture, but they have a removable lid on top um, that allows us to access and assess the contents of the nest um, uh, basically every single day. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, but I'll explain a little bit more about the nest boxes in just a second. Then thirdly, there's a, uh, there's a camera trap uh, here on the left next to the, uh, well, uh, to your right of the male sitting here. Um, and that basically allowed me to uh, get video footage of every time a hornbill visited the nest. Um, and that sort of gave us the, the, the data on their breeding behavior um, at, or provisioning behavior every time they came to and from the nest. Um, and I'll also explain a little bit more about that as we go. Um, then what you'll notice in, in, the, in the bottom right hand uh, corner of the picture here, I hope you can see it, is a, is a sort of small brown box be beneath the, the, the nest box that has um, a set of batteries in it, uh, so a very heavy, very large set of batteries that powers a reader, which is actually not in this picture, but it powers a reader um, that allows uh, allowed me to capture the body temperatures of the hornbills every time they visited a nest. And it also allowed me to capture the body temperature of the hornbills inside the nest every single minute throughout the day. So we get this uh, amazing sort of continuous body temperature profile of the, of the hornbills throughout the day. Um, and we did that basically by injecting a, a, a small tag. It's called a passive integrated transponder. It's a pit tag. Some of you may be familiar with them with your pets. We get ones that are temperature sensitive. Um, and we inject that in between the shoulder beds of the birds underneath the skin. And then that allows us to get their, to get their body temperatures. Um, this uh, pole that the hornbill, the male hornbill sitting on over on this side here uh, is a supplementary feeding station. Uh, I, I'm not really going to go into it because it's not really pertinent to this particular talk, but basically what it allowed me to do is experimentally uh, adjust the amount of food that the hornbills were getting on a daily basis. I, I had a treatment that had, was getting a, an absolute uh, ton of food per day and then, and then a treatment that was getting um, very, very little. But I, it won't really come up, but that is the that is what this hornbill is sitting on. 
Um, so overall, you've got the, the hornbills, you've got the, the camera trap for, for gathering behavioral data, you've got the nest boxes, which I can check every day to monitor the progress of a breeding attempt. Uh, there's readers set up at the nest boxes that allow me to record the body temperature of the birds and, uh, and then the supplementary feeding station. So good. Uh, that's literally almost everything you need to see to know what you kind of need to know about my study system. Um, and I hope that that is making some sense. So as I said, I, I want to explain a little bit more about the, about the nest boxes. Um, when Southern Yellowbilled Hornbills begin a breeding attempt, uh, the female actually seals herself inside of the nest. Um, and then she molts all of her flight feathers when she's done that uh, as soon as she lays eggs. So she's sitting inside there, having lost all of her flight feathers and literally sealed the entrance, leaving only a small gap. And it leaves her completely incapable of leaving the nest to forage for herself for, for a couple of months until her feathers regrow. So for the majority of the breeding attempt, uh, while the female has locked herself inside, the male does all of the provisioning to both the female and the chicks when they hatch. So it's, it's, it's kind of this incredible system of trust uh, uh, in a way um, where the male is left completely responsible for the females, uh, not only for their reproductive success, but also for the female's survival. Um, and uh, it's, it's obviously, you know, has its risks and its rewards. The, the risk um, is that something happens to the male and he, uh, you know, he can't either can't provision enough food or if he dies and can't get food to the female, then she has a chance of dying or, uh, you know, the, there's a risk to the chicks. Um, but the reward is really massive. So, uh, I know that this video is going to be a little bit jumpy, but you hopefully get the, the right impression here. What's happening here is this is a really uh, quite a severe hailstorm out in the Kalahari. Um, and you can see that it's sort of rocking the, the camera trap around. There's lightning. There's all sorts going on. And you can imagine that um, if you have a, a, a normal sort of exposed cup nest, which a lot of birds do, um, that would be either damaged or destroyed or at risk in a storm like this, um, but not so for the hornbills, which are kept safe and sound inside of their sealed, inside of their sealed cavity. Uh, and then of course, there's the uh, predation avoidance. Uh, so here you can see a common genet having a, a really good look at the entrance to the nest box there, hoping he can get a midnight snack, but uh, the, he's not able to get into the nest box because obviously of this amazing seal that the female puts on it. And if you if you look closely, I, I hope the video is playing well enough for you to see this, but you can actually see her bill sort of poking out a little bit through the, the small opening that they leave in that in that uh, cavity seal. Uh, and she's sort of letting the genet, genet know that she's she's there and, and uh, the genet certainly won't be getting a meal this evening. Uh, and then I just, I just included uh, uh, this video basically um, because we we have to go, I, we, we set up a bunch of camera traps and there are, uh, anyone that's worked with camera traps will know this, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of camera trap footage um, of absolutely nothing, uh, where the camera traps have been triggered by a stick or a you know, grass blowing or any kind of wind movement. Um, and you have to go through all of these, all of these videos. Um, and it's, it's very time consuming and tedious, but every now and then, uh, you see something interesting that you weren't expecting, like uh, this eyebuck that that strolls past the nest, triggering the camera trap in the night. Doesn't quite make up for all of the hundreds of hours that I spent going through footage. Uh, and I must thank my assistants for all of the time and effort that they dedicated to this as well. I was certainly not the only person doing that. Um, hopefully, seeing an eyebuck occasionally made it a bit better for them. Um, okay, so. Another picture just here of a, of a sort of typical nest setup uh, where you, you have the nest box uh, up on the tree here, uh, the camera trap, the, that supplementary feeding station. Um, and this here is one of the setups. This was the, a, a different form of the setup we used to get the body temperature data. So this loop that goes over the box here um, is just another loop that it's basically a reader that can pick up those body temperature tags. Um, and what you'll, you'll see is that this particular setup is actually solar powered, uh, which is really nice for, for leaving it out for a couple of days at a time, sort of leave it out for two or three days in one location, you, and uh, it, you don't have to change the batteries every single day. So from that, from that point of view, it's quite nice. 
in another sense, um, this setup is very ungainly uh, and weighs about 35 kilograms. So um, I, I do not have the fondest of memories of moving this setup uh, kilometers and kilometers in the Kalahari sun between nests. Um, and, and looking at it now is, is um, I have to say, not filling me with all that much joy. So I'll move right on to, to the next slide. Um, so what I need to do, the last thing I, I, I would like to explain uh, is how the Kalahari works. Um, you know, some of you, you know, many of you will probably know, and, or at least you'll know kind of how deserts work, but I, again, it's always good to, to at least reiterate these things. Um, so my site is one that goes through this, this incredible seasonal change from a, a very dry, cool winter where basically nothing really grows and the ground is essentially bare, as you can see in this picture, uh, through to a very hot and rainy season in the late spring and through the summer. And my last field season of my PhD, which is uh, 20, 20, 2021, um, this, over that summer was, was really ex absolutely extraordinary. Um, where it went from this, which is kind of typically what it looks like through the winter, um, to this, uh, which was just unbelievable. There were reports of over 250 millimeters of rain falling in a single afternoon. Uh, and then finally, that led to there being a uh, sort of two to three meter deep river uh, running directly through my field site, which was quite amazing. Um, so just... Just to go through this, this is what collecting data at an S-Box normally looks like. Um, this uh, here is, in fact, not me. Uh, this is this is uh, my wonderful assistant, Amy Hunter. What she's actually doing is downloading the data from inside of this nest box. Uh, there's a small little logger that is getting the nest temperature data for us. And uh, it's called an I button. Uh, some of you would have worked with them or know of them. and. We use them to get nest, nest temperature data and she's busy downloading that. That's This is kind of the typical scene of what it would look like. And uh, this is what checking a nest looked like in my last uh, field season, where I, myself and my, my uh, terrific assistant, Justin Jacobs, actually had to swim out to, the, uh, to, check, on this, to check on this particular nest. Um, and uh, these these chicks, the, the three of them, they fledged absolutely perfectly. They were all they were all fine and well, and they they did not flood, thankfully. Um, but yeah, pretty pretty extraordinary to have to swim out to check your nest boxes uh, in the Kalahari Desert. Uh, so anyway, I, I digress a bit, but basically the the point is that there's this huge seasonality. And it creates a situation where the resource abundance in the, in the system coincides, or the highest resource abundance in the system coincides with the period of the highest temperatures. So basically, the, the hornbills are constrained to breed uh, when it's rained because they need the resources that come with the rain. But um, it creates a big problem, especially for the males who, who, as I said earlier, they're provisioning just on their own for a lot of the breeding attempt. Um, they have to now sort of trade off their foraging effort um, and their own activity against their thermoregulation because they're breeding at the hottest time of the year. And then you have to also remember that the, the females are sealed inside of this nest box with the eggs and the nestlings. So they don't, uh, they don't have the option basically to escape uh, the heat or forage for themselves to get more food and water. They have to rely on that male. Um, so they're also very, very vulnerable to high temperatures during, during the breeding attempt. So for my PhD, I, I basically uh, had uh, essentially two, two seasons. Um, and one is, is normal, if you can call it that, which was in 2019, 2020. Uh, I call it the hot and dry breeding season. And then there was this outrageous season with this, with this uh, incredible flooding, which I uh, quite generously call the cool and wet season. And uh, I call it that because uh, after a chat with my supervisor, um, she said that calling it the insane season where the highest amount of rain ever on record fell and flooded the, the whole Kalahari bisecting my field site um, was a little bit wordy as a, as a phrase to continuously repeat throughout the thesis. So changed it to cool and wet, although uh, please do bear in mind that when you see cool and wet, that means that it was, well, it was extraordinary. Um, uh, so yeah, just keep in mind that there's this, there's this incredible seasonality 
um, one fairly normal season, one cool and wet season. And the, the normal season had sort of the usual change that you suspect uh, when the rain comes, you get sort of this increase in food availability, but presumably food's still kind of limiting. It is a desert and food is never uh, really abundant. Um, and then the cool and wet season had this unbelievable explosion of vegetation and food in the system. So there's just this huge difference between uh, not only winter and summer, but between these two uh, breeding seasons. So what I'll uh, go ahead and do now is sort of give a, 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 a just a very brief overview of some of the some of the more interesting findings from my PhD. I, I, obviously, I can't go through all of them, um, but I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about some interesting findings of the male, uh, the females when they're sealed inside the box, something about the chicks, and then at the end, I'm going to sort of show you how that all ties into a, into a big picture. So really, uh, sort of an abridged an abridged version of the of the results here. Um, so for the males, as I said, I had uh, camera traps up at the nests recording the uh, provisioning. And here we have the male uh, who's called Moby. He is uh, provisioning to his female who's called Granny Weatherwax. Um, and you can see now, you can see that loop antenna that's powered by those batteries in that brown box below the nest. And that is collecting his body temperature as he arrives at the nest. And it's also uh, recording the body temperature of the female inside the nest box all day. And then when one of the chicks hatches, we tag one of them as well, and it records the chick's body temperature. All right, so um, I know you mostly came to this talk so that you could see graphs. Uh, I, I absolutely love graphs. Um, and I, I hope some of you feel that same way. I know not everyone does, but hopefully this is not too painful for those of you uh, that do not like graphs, but I think these are great. Um, even if I say so myself. Uh, so this is this is a, a graph of the number of times in a day that the male hornbill provisioned to uh, to the nest on the y-axis, and it's as a function of the mean uh, the the maximum air temperature on that given day. So you can see that there are data for the uh, cool and wet season, which is sort of this grayed out dashed line here, and the triangles, and then for the hot and dry season, which is the solid black line with the with the darker circles. Um, and what you can see here firstly is that there was a, a big difference between those two breeding seasons. The, the cool and wet season, which uh, as I said, corresponds to a lot more food in the system, um, allowed the males to provision um, much, much more basically across all air temperatures that we could record them. And uh, then you can see that in, in both seasons, the uh, provisioning rate declines as air temperatures increase as you move from left to right uh, across the x-axis. So uh, basically this graph is showing you, it's showing you two, two things, uh, essentially. Uh, firstly, that the, uh, the cool and wet season allowed the males to get a lot more food to the nests across all air temperatures. But secondly, that air temperatures, regardless uh, of the season, were limiting for the provisioning rate of the hornbills that did decrease as temperatures increased. So it just shows that there is a negative effect of, of increasing or high air temperatures on the, uh, the behavior of the males. Okay, then onto the females. Um, for the females, I, I collected uh, data by visiting the nest boxes every single day to see what was happening inside them, basically. So I was gathering data on uh, when the female sealed herself in. And uh, in the left-hand picture here, you can see a, a, a female staring, I think, hopefully lovingly up at me uh, as I take a photo of her through that uh, or underneath that lid on the top of the nest box. And it allowed me to gather data on when she molts all of her flight feathers. Um, you can see a female in this sort of central top picture here. Um, she's surrounded by the her flight feathers that she's molted and she's got some eggs with her. So I also, it allows me to see uh, when she lays her eggs and how many she lays. They they lay eggs uh, asynchronously. So they lay one and then about two days pass, then they lay a second, two days pass, they lay a third. And they, they typically lay somewhere between sort of two and six. Um, and they lay those sort of over a period of time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it allows me to see how many eggs and then when those eggs hatch, uh, or indeed when those eggs fail to hatch, which is, is actually because the female's eaten them. Um, the, the female, <laughs> The females are, are uh, they're pretty scary, actually. 
um, they, they cannibalize their own eggs and actually sometimes their own chicks as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes them, makes them a little bit uh, terrifying, but I, I sort of talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but uh, basically then in, in, the, in the last couple of pictures here, you can see uh, one picture I'm injecting that pit tag in between the, the bird's shoulder blades so I can get its body temperature. And then what I also did was I uh, take, I would take uh, measurements of the tail as it regrew uh, to, to check the rate of its growth. And uh, I would also weigh, weigh the females. And all of this basically is happening, visiting the nest once a day and taking weights and measurements once a week. Uh, all right, so basically the, probably the most interesting thing for me about the, the results I got with the females is to do with their body temperatures. So in the graph on the left, you have the body temperature of the females inside the nest when they're incubating. Okay, that's on the y-axis. Um, and then on the right graph, you have the body temperature of the females when there are no more eggs and they're only with chicks. So when they're not, they are no longer incubating. And both of these graphs have the temperature inside the, uh, inside the nest at the time that the body temperature was taken. So uh, the, the dotted line is at, about, is at 41 degrees Celsius. And that is, uh, that's important because at 41 degrees Celsius, that's when eggs are at a risk of lethal uh, heat exposure. So that dotted line is showing you the temperature above which eggs are really at risk um, of basically of dying. So you can see that when the females are incubating, they manage to keep their body temperatures down, um, which I, I find really fascinating. And that's regardless of the air temperature. So they're keeping their body temperature in some instances very far below the air temperature inside of the nest box. Um, and that's essentially, I think, to keep the eggs cool, which I, which I think is really remarkable. And then you can see that in the right-hand graph, as soon as they're not incubating anymore, they show a really sort of much more pronounced, what, what we call facultative hypothermia, which is where they allow their body temperatures to increase um, well above 41 degrees Celsius. Um, so just this, this incredible phenomenon of them changing their thermoregulatory pattern, depending on whether they've got eggs or not, um, which, I, which I find really, really fascinating. There, there are a couple of alternative explanations for this, but I, that's sort of the one that I, I believe to be the case. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just find this a super, super interesting pattern. Uh, then I've got, I've just got this, this quick video to, to intercut the graphs, um, uh, which is just a, a male uh, attempting to provision to the nest. And he's, he's not entirely understanding why the female is not accepting his food, which he's fought so hard to find and bring to her. Um, and uh, she breaks out after she's been in the nest for about two months. Uh, and she's regrown her, her flight feathers and able to break out and then continue to fly and forage for herself. And then she also provisions to the nest. Uh, but I, I basically have this video in to show you how strange and awkward breaking out of this small uh, cavity to the nest is um, and how the male doesn't seem to know what's going on. Uh, all right, then uh, finally onto the chicks. So a uh, very similar thing for them. Once per week, I would take uh, I would take measurements on their weights. I would take uh, measurements on their feather growth and on their bone growth uh, as they develop. And they, as you can see in, in these photos, they, they start out life uh, as being absolutely hideous. And then they quite rapidly um, manage to stay hideous over the period of quite a few weeks. But eventually they turn into these uh, absolutely wonderful and majestic blue-eyed fledglings that we uh, that we know and love so um yeah basically I'm, I'm keeping track of them every single day of of the way and taking these measurements once a week so here i think you know potentially the most interesting finding was uh, one of the most interesting findings was that the average length of the tarsal bones uh, which are the, the you know bones in their legs um, it, and this, uh, on the y-axis, you have the, the length of the tarsus when, at the time that the bird fledges. And uh, you have this as a function of the, the mean maximum temperature, air temperature or nest temperature, um, over the course that that was growing. So basically from the time the chick hatched until it fledged, that's, this is the, the average temperature during that period. And what you can see is that 
as air temperatures uh, are higher during the period of growth, the tarsi, when they fledge, are smaller. So it, it basically it suggests a negative effect of very high temperatures during growth on the developmental cycle of, of the bird. So there's some sort of compromise there uh, or negative effect of high temperatures on their growth. And what you have to obviously as well keep in mind is that at higher temperatures, those I showed that those males are provisioning less uh, as well. So they, they're, they're also getting less food, which might tie into this. Um, and obviously thermoregulation might also be more costly for them. So a lot of, a lot of things could explain this, but just fascinating that uh, higher temperatures cause reduced or correlate to reduced growth in the chicks. Uh, then I've just uh, got a quick video of a parent now trying to provision uh, uh, to the chick as the chick now tries to break out of the nest. The chicks actually reseal the nests after the female breaks out. And then the chicks themselves have to then break their own seal and uh, get out of the nests. And this also is, is amazingly um, awkward and I absolutely love watching it. Okay, finally, I did promise to, to tie this all into a big picture. Um, and I'm gonna show you basically the long-term breeding data of this population of hornbills uh, in the period we were monitoring them between 2008 and 2019, essentially uh, for, for the purposes of, this, of these graphs. So each data point here represents uh, an entire breeding season. So you are seeing 10 years worth of, of data here. And uh, in the top panel is the percentage of nest boxes that were used for breeding in a given breeding season at my field site. And uh, in the bottom panel is the percentage of those attempts which ended up being successful. And success is basically defined as being able to fledge at least one chick is, is basically what constitutes a successful breeding attempt. So basically over this period, 20, 2008 to 2019, you can see that there's this uh, steady collapse in the breeding performance of these hornbills, both in the number of boxes that they're occupying, but also in their, uh, the number of uh, successful attempts that they manage to produce, even if they do occupy a box, um, both sort of crash over that period. So uh, we have what, what we have is, is a collapse in the breeding performance of the hornbills over that decade period that we're monitoring them. Uh, and it's correlating to increasing temperatures in the Kalahari. But of course, correlation is not causation. And you do have to investigate further uh, what could be causing, what could be causing that, that trend. So uh, here I have the percentage of attempts which were successful again, fledging at least one chick uh, with higher with uh, higher rainfall during the breeding season correlating to a much higher probability of success. So you can see the drought versus the non-drought. And as I pointed out, you know, rainfall drives primary productivity. So, uh, and that's, you know, that's the energy available to the entire trophic cascade uh, from, you know, from plants uh, primary through to insects, the things that feed on insects, including hornbills and up. Um, so basically this, this relationship between rainfall and success makes, makes a huge amount of sense. Uh, the more rainfall there is, the more food there is for the hornbills, and the greater their chance of breeding successfully. Um, and I've, I've got a, a video here that, that kind of shows you this, uh, this effect, and it's, it's a male provisioning to the female. He has clearly gotten absolutely soaked uh, during, a, during a breeding attempt. The, the nest itself is, is still dripping, um, but basically it's a good example of how he has this extremely lush vegetation around him, uh, and this is in the Kalahari Desert. Um, but he's been able to find this nice, big, juicy moth to, to provision. There's presumably quite a lot of food like that around in the system. Um, and that's all because of the rain. So remember those, those very first results showing that increased uh, rainfall led to more provisioning. This just gives you a, a visual of just how striking uh, that effect can be. Uh, then, you know, I've got a, a, a graph here basically of the probability of a nesting attempt managing to successfully fledge at least one chick. And this is uh, as a function of, and this is a bit of a mouthful, but it's the percentage of days on uh, during the breeding attempt on which the maximum air temperature was above the threshold air temperature at which males show a 50% likelihood of engaging in heat dissipation behavior. I know that that is a mouthful. Basically, what the x-axis is showing you is the percentage of days when the provisioning males were heat stressed, essentially. 
Um, so as you move from left to right, you're getting more and more days during the breeding attempt where the male was experiencing heat stress. Um, so this is for non drought years, which is this solid black line and for drought years, which is this red uh, dashed line. And essentially you can see that during non drought years uh, or during drought years, there's this near, uh, near ubiquitous failure in the reproduction of, of the hornbills. And uh, basically, regardless of the air temperature, the, the, the success rate is very low. And that sort of reiterates that really strong dependency on, uh, on rainfall and the resources that come with the rain. But then you can see in non-drought years, there is a really strong temperature effect coming through. So with higher temperatures during the breeding attempt, um, the, it, you get this drastic reduction in the uh, chance of that attempt being successful. So uh, what you'll remember, obviously, the males, as temperatures increase, they're provisioning less. Um, the, the, the females are experiencing heat stress. Chicks are not growing as well. And we're seeing basically this, this strong decline in their chance of breeding successfully. And what you'll notice is that above uh, about 72% of days during the attempt that the male is experiencing heat stress, there's not a single successful breeding attempt in drought or non-drought years. Um, not, not one over, over a 10 year period. And that sort of correlates to an average temperature during the breeding attempt of about 35.7 degrees Celsius. So not, not even that hot, you know, for a, for a desert. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a paper recently by one of my colleagues, um, Shannon Conradi and, and uh, the people she was working with uh, relatively recently, a few, a few years ago now, but basically they showed that this, uh, that uh, maximum temperatures over the course of the summer are going to approach this temperature threshold of 35.7 degrees Celsius, um, above which the hornbills are managing not a single successful breeding attempt um, through basically the entire hornbills range by 2080. So while they're sort of common as we know them now, uh, you know, by the turn of the century, we, we could be seeing a very, very different picture indeed. Uh, these these, these uh, findings were published uh, last year in uh, Frontiers, so anyone that wants to can, can go look up a little bit more about them or chat to me, obviously, at the end of this, um, but you, you're welcome to go read about that as well. So uh, basically, I'll, I'll sum up. Um, there's, there is a climate crisis. It's, it's ongoing. Um, and you saw in that very first graph that I showed you right at the beginning of the talk, uh, temperatures are increasing really rapidly out in the Kalahari. And from the data we have so far, it seems that the, the that low resources definitely lead to reproductive failure. But the crash that we're seeing in the in the performance of the hornbills, at least by population at my field site, seems to def, uh, there's really strong evidence that it's driven by increasing temperatures in that region. So essentially, my my PhD, the the, the broad strokes is that it's shown that both low uh, low resources but also high temperatures. Um, are both partially uh, responsible for uh, a dip and uh, negative effects on the reproduction reproduction of the of the hornbills. Um, so overall, basically, we we know that there are unavoidable negative effects of high temperatures on the physiology and behavior of arid zone birds, and and we're seeing those effects um, uh, along with effects of of low resources causing uh, basically a catastrophic failure of reproduction in the hornbills at my field site. And if, if we sort of make a projection and go based on how dramatic the negative effects are, um, the rate of warming in the region, we, we can essentially then predict that we'll start seeing near complete breeding failure um, in the hornbills, you know, probably within the next decade across a lot of the hottest parts of their range. And then considering that they only uh, live to be about 10 years old, at least uh, that's the, the, the evidence we have at our field site, um, we can basically predict that across a lot of the hottest parts of their range, we're going to start seeing them be uh, locally extirpated, unfortunately, uh, over the course of, of the next few decades. So, um, you know, quite a quite a stark sort of striking uh, effect that we're that we're seeing from from rapid climate warming. And you know, this whole story, obviously, from my PhD, is very specific to the hornbills, but you can imagine that this is this is probably true for a lot of arid zone species. Um, that are similarly uh, constrained to breed during that hottest period of the year because their breeding is reliant on rainfall that falls at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I know that that's a little bit grim, but as I said, please visit the Kalahari as soon as possible because um, 
uh, we, we get the sense that over the next few decades, it's not, it's not going to be quite the same pace. Um, but yeah, all, all that remains, and wow, time time really does fly. Um, all that remains is for is for me to thank all of you um, for your attention. I, I hope I hope you enjoyed the talk. I, I apologize terribly for the grim ending, um, but I hope it, I hope at least it was interesting. And uh, thanks so much to to Derek and Learn the Birds for inviting me to speak. And uh, yeah, I think got a got a few minutes for questions, and I'm I'm always happy to always happy to take them where I can. So thanks so much. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. I don't know if you want me to read them out or if you want to just grab them from, from the chat uh, yourself. I'll tell you what, I'll just stop sharing and then I can, uh, and then I can go through them and go through them myself. Um, yeah, let me just, uh, let me just scroll down here. Um, yeah, thanks. Well, thanks so much to, to those of you that, that uh, said that you enjoyed it. I, that's always good to hear. Um, I, I hope more than anything else that I'm just not boring. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Hilary, I, I uh, yeah, thanks again so much to all of you for for your attention. Um, why why do they breed uh, in the hot dry season uh, at all when it's when it's so averse? So yeah, I mean that's 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 the that's the kind of uh, dilemma for them. You know, if they if they breed uh, outside of the hottest periods of the year, um, that's in the Kalahari, that's outside of the rainy season, and basically there just aren't enough resources. There's just not enough food um, for them to to guarantee that they'll breed successfully. They they um, you know they obviously they take this huge risk. Uh, you know the female locks herself inside this nest, and after she's molted her flight feathers, she's stuck for two months. And if the male can't bring her enough food, she'll she'll die. Um, so essentially, they they have to breed when it's rained in the Kalahari because they they have to have the food. So um, a lot of other species have in different habitats and in, in more music places they have the option to breed and kind of avoid uh, the the hottest periods of the year. And some some birds actually even in the Kalahari can breed outside of that period because they rely on a food source that isn't as uh, reliant on the rain, for instance. But um, yeah, for the hornbills, it's it's just essential. Uh, I hope hope that answers that okay. Uh, Derek, you can you can tell me if if what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. Uh, oh, makes, makes perfectly good sense, and uh, <laughs> it is all linked to resources, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's that's sort of yeah. It's it was the the idea that sparked my sparked my PhD. Um, yeah. Then uh, Lynette, is it possible that the hornbills could move to other areas that are not so hot? Um, you know. We, the, it's it's absolutely incredible, and and um, if any of you are are in are involved in atlasing, uh, you know the the birding the scientific birding community cannot thank you enough, and I, I'm not sure you ever get the praise that you quite deserve. Uh, I know that atlasing can in and of itself be be kind of rewarding and fun, but you're you're contributing to the most incredible um, citizen science database, uh, uh, basically one of the oldest in the world and one of the most uh, extensive and extraordinary and what what we what we get to see basically with those data that that all of you are collecting uh, is the movements and changes in birds distributions over time, uh, and we are seeing basically uh, not a, not necessarily what you might call a movement, but a contraction of some species. Their ranges getting smaller and smaller as they move away from from places that are unsuitable potentially because of high temperatures. And we're also seeing some species move into areas that they weren't previously in because uh, it, the, the habitat actually is becoming more suitable uh, as temperatures or climate changes over time. So for instance, uh, a lot of Northern Europe was, was not accessible to a lot of birds uh, historically because it was in fact too cold. With climate change and climate warming in those regions now, birds that have, have never been seen as far north as they have are now being seen. So uh, essentially they, they are moving. Uh, or, or at least their distributions are changing. Um, but basically, it, it you know it doesn't mean that there's now more hornbills further east. What it means is there's less hornbills further west. Basically, is is the unfortunate reality. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, it's it's it is a it's a great question. It's one that get asked that does get asked uh, of birders all the time. And birds are fortunate that they can move, um, which which is terrific. But you can imagine for a lot of species, including plants, uh, which which must certainly not be forgotten. Uh, they can't, you know, they can't move um, really. So 
or can't move fast enough. Um, so, so birds have that, have that kind of advantage, but a lot of species certainly do not, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, horn, hornbills are, I think, going to be one of the changes to the Kalahari over time, but I'm, I'm sure that they won't be, they certainly won't be the only one. Um, I, I hope that, that that's, uh, satisfactory. Lynette and yeah, you know, feel, feel free to pop a follow up if I haven't answered it well enough. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, Angela, the, what what point triggers the female to to regrow her flight feathers? So, um, as I, I'm sure most of you sort of know about the normal molt cycle of birds is is kind of uh, haphazard is the wrong term, but they they breed and then after they're done breeding, they go through a a, a sort of asynchronous molt where they lose feathers sort of consecutively and then regrow kind of one at a time, so that at any given moment they have a full set of, of flight feathers. Um, the hornbills are, are kind of extraordinary in this way that the female molts all of them at once. And uh, and she basically does that as soon as she lays an egg. So that's sort of the trigger that she's now committed to this breeding attempt. She's sealed herself inside the cavity. She's laid an egg. So she's 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 in this now for the long run, basically. Um, and she'll molt, molt all of her flight feathers and, and breed and molt at the same time, which is which is very unusual in birds. Um, but yeah, essentially they, they molt their five feathers and start growing the new ones immediately. And it, it takes, it takes quite some time to regrow them to the point that they're actually useful for flight. But the, the benefit is that, um, when she does break out of the nest box, she has a completely new set of flight feathers, which, which is, is hugely advantageous to a bird, um, to have, to have, you know, brand, basically a brand new set. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it comes with a with a big benefit at the end of the day, but but the massive risk that after she's molted them, the male dies and then she is unfortunately trapped and with nowhere to go. So it's it's quite an extraordinary breeding system, really. Um, but uh, but it's a good example of natural selection in action, isn't it? Because because if you're if you're inside there and you're sealed in, and you have to do the the, the haphazard approach that you talked about, you're your survival is probably going to be less. Uh, and so your ability mm. to leave your genes in the next generation is going to be smaller. And and yeah. so it, it, it makes sense that if any uh, uh, gene existed for for bringing the, the molting of the feathers closer together, it'd be selected for in, in response to that behavior. And it shows how animals' behavior has an impact on natural selection. Not It's not just the external environment. It's it's actually influenced by their behavior. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely, you know, uh, they, they I, it's it's kind of extraordinary that their whole breeding ecology with with molting all of their flight feathers at once and and seal, actually sealing the nest entrance is, is truly remarkable. Um, so, you know, and, and obviously all of that is is that basically is because it's very, very beneficial in some ways. If it works, it, it works tremendously well. Uh, and if, you know, if it doesn't work, there's a very high cost, but, but yeah, that's, that's where natural selection has taken them. And it's, it's really a most amazing, um, most amazing system. Um, yeah, but, uh, I'll, uh, I'll see, see what else is here. But, uh, yeah. So, um, as a thanks. Yeah, it, it is, a, it is a little bit morbid. Um, but, uh, what would the females, what would the female hornball, uh, pick the, would the female hornball pick the smallest, uh, or youngest chick to cannibalize? Um, yes, basically they start if, if they have the oldest chick hatch, um, and they start cannibalizing at that point, they'll actually, they'll eat the, the last laid egg. If there's any eggs still in the nest, they'll eat the eggs until there's only chicks left. And then when there are only chicks left, they'll, they'll eat, uh, the youngest or smallest or latest hatched Well, it's always those are always coincide, but the, the latest hatched uh, chick first, and then they'll work their way up um, and basically get to the, the first hatched oldest chick last. Uh, it is, it's kind of a, it's this bet hedging strategy where they, they have more, uh, more eggs and more chicks than they might be able to, to actually fledge. And then they, they reduce the brood size as they, as they go along. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That is exactly, that is exactly what they do. Um, and 
yeah uh, or thanks thanks for the for the for the positive feedback from from those of you leaving comments that's that's always lovely um yeah and uh let me see if there's any other any other questions here um yeah so uh i'm probably going to butcher the name i might not even say it um the <laughs> are there any uh are there any alike data about other bird species um Broadly speaking, yes, uh, there, there, there's, you know, there's a lot of people doing absolutely phenomenal work um, in all sorts of parts of the world on the, the reproductive ecology of birds. Um, there's quite a lot of work now on birds dealing with high temperatures, which is wonderful to have, you know, we, a few decades ago, there was, there were literally, you know, a handful of papers worldwide um, that, that dealt with how, how birds deal with high temperatures. And now we are seeing not not only sing, singular research papers, but the whole labs coming up in on different continents dealing with this issue. So, um, yeah, there's there's a there's a wealth a tremendous wealth of data coming out now. Um, my PhD at the time that it started was sort of probing into the uh, the the sort of lesser known uh, avenue of of the interactions between resources and temperature because previously we had kind of mostly focused on on just temperature. So that was sort of what I was getting into, but um, yeah, there's there's fascinating data on a lot of species, and well, I I, uh, I I lament to tell you that it it tells a similar story. Uh, unfortunately, that that birds are are struggling. Uh, they're struggling with with climate change, and we're seeing increasing frequency of mass mortality events associated with heat. Um, and it, the the picture is it's painting is is a little bit grim, but ultimately the idea is that we're doing this research so that we can so that we can do something about it and um you know it's it's all it's all in a conservation effort uh so hopefully over time we can we can figure out some some solutions um but yeah no there, there are other there are the data there are the fantastic scientists doing a, an amazing range of work um and i i certainly i count myself lucky to be among them um but uh yeah I, I don't think Derek. I don't think I missed any questions. I don't think there was no, any. I think uh, I think you've got them all. Um, no, thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it, and uh, we are putting this on YouTube, right? I I always forget. Um, yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Yeah, so tell your friends go watch it on YouTube for those who missed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm glad that it's it, it exists in uh, in or I don't know if posterity is the correct word, but I'm glad that it continues to exist. Um, it's always nice nice to reach as many people as possible. So, yeah, if, if you did enjoy it, I'm very happy for anyone to be directed to the to the YouTube video. And then, uh, for those of you who are still here, we do have um, another interesting webinar coming up next month, which is uh, by Adam Scott Ken Kennedy on producing the birds of East Africa, the first fully photographic field guide to the birds of the region. So I think that will also be interesting, especially to the, those of you who are, who are keen to see what's happening in East Africa. <laughs>